Hello and welcome to the hearing. I'm John. And hello from Chicago's North Side. I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album, which is from 1975, Siren by Roxy Music. Roxy Music were an English art rock band formed in 1970 by vocalist Brian Ferry, who also included Brian Eno for their first two albums. The I group... always thought he was in much longer than that. It yeah, was shocked just West the first two. Like, Wait, just the first two, and not even like the song, I, my favorite song of theirs he was mm. on. The group's original name, Roxy, was partly an homage to the titles of old cinemas and dance halls, and partly a, and probably partly a pun on the word rock. Um, I say probably because there's no citation on that. Mm. But I would say most likely it is. Um, They added the word Roxy, the word music to their name after learning of an American band who were also named Roxy. Seems to happen a lot. (laughs) Well, back then, you know, you didn't get albums from other countries so easily. Yeah. So you had no idea what was going on. But, you know, if you find a band with a random number in their name, they probably added it to differentiate from some other band. Yeah. Siren is Roxy Music's fifth studio album. It was released on October 24th, 1975 on Island Records in the UK and Akka Records in the US. Produced by Chris Thomas and Features, Ryan Ferry on vocals, keyboards, and harmonica, Andy McKay on oboe and saxophone. How many albums are we going to have with an oboe on it? (laughs) Phil Manzanera on guitar. Eddie, jo- Eddie Jobson on violin, synthesizers, and keyboards. John, I'll say Gustafson could be Gustafson uh, on bass. And Paul Thompson on drums. Reminder, I don't edit any songs into our reviews for copyright reasons. But down in the description, if you're listening to this on YouTube or on our blog at johnescotto.com, you'll find links to Siren on Spotify and YouTube so you can follow along if you'd like. On to track one, Love is the Drug, probably their best known song. First time I heard this... I've always been kind of, you know, I've been on the fence about this one. There's Mm -hmm. parts I like and parts I've always been like, "Mm." (laughs) This is one I listen to a lot, the Roxy version. Um, I'm probably just going to call him Roxy from now on. I'll drop the music just to make life easier. Um, First time I heard this was the Grace Jones cover. Oh, really? It was on MTV a lot. Listened to it earlier today. Oh, it's no, it's horrible. It's horrible. Um, (laughs) And... I'm surprised you've been on the fence with this. You're on the fence with this one. Because yeah. to my ears, there is a metric fuck ton of Duran Duran in this song. Uh, I would say more talking heads. Honestly. Okay, I hear, I hear a lot of that too. Um, I, I found a quote. I wasn't sure if Roxy was like a direct influence on Duran, but I, I saw a quote from Niall Rogers who said that they loved this song. And Bernard Edwards borrowed the bass line for good times. I, I mean, I would say... And I know Sheik was tracks, a big influence on Duran. There are track. There is a track later that is like way more Duran than There's this. There's another even, one that does sound Duran. Um, this was like, yeah. holy shit. <laughs> this one does sound a lot like Duran to me. I uh, love the walking and car sound effects at the beginning. Just kind of an oddball choice. Um it's kind of like you know Ian Anderson mixing the drink and humming to himself uh, at at the beginning of um, oh I can't think of the title um but one of their one of the tall songs um I mean Ian Anderson is the the nail on the head I think though I think and a lot of people would be shocked to hear I think someone say that but there's one song in particular he sounds a lot like tall influence here yeah um. That's interesting. He's not the person I would expect you to go to to, influ- to have influenced these guys. Um, the opening lyric kind of doesn't really connect melodically or lyrically with the song. Um, Taint no big thing for, to wait for the bell to ring. Taint no big thing to toll the bell. Um, doesn't make sense in context. Because the song is just really about going out to a singles bar and picking someone up. Yeah. Yeah, about that. Kind of being addicted to it, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, love is the drug. <laughs> love is the drug, yeah. Um, um, I mean, it kind of sounds like James Brown trying to do Prague. It's kind of an interesting combination, it's which a, is which is how you get talking heads, of course, well, out of it. It's a bunch of white English guys trying to be funky. And um, I mean, I'd say he succeeds through some of it. Mm-hmm. It's when they get to that that pop chorus, or I don't know if you'd call it a chorus. The slower or chorus or the where, faster chorus? Yeah, the, the slower chorus, okay. where, you know. Yeah. 
that's that kind of breaks the spell for me. That that's only what what's kept me from just being like, this song is fucking awesome because it, it's a departure. I mean, it's a bit of a left turn. I'll give you that. Um, I do like the it's drums. It's a great groove, and then I feel it's kind of ruined by this. Mm-hmm. Whoa, <laughs> you know? I, it's like, wait, what? <laughs> I do like the drum fills on that that slow chorus though. Nice hollow sound. Yeah. Um, but the beginning, I just love the bass. John Gustafson does yes. not get. I've never heard of him before. Every bass player should know his name. He was an influence on Bernard Edwards, who was a god among bass players. Why does John Gustafson not get anything? Because the man is a genius. Um, The bass leads most of this album uh, and does it brilliantly, Um, including this song. This song is pure bass. Um, Love the dissonant sax riff at the very beginning. Like, it's a little bit out of tune, but just enough to kind of catch your attention. (laughs) I think Al Jurgensen used, I don't think he sampled, but I think he just used that in like his last album. And uh-huh. it was really, they were a lot of fun because he's got that and like the sample from Network and nice. just like ministry uh-huh. sounds just <laughs> blaring around. Right. And just to have that dun 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 in the middle yeah. of the, oh, of the sax. And I was reading up on their influences. Uh, Ferry did a little interview. Said he has a ton of influences. Menzanera, because he's Latin, Latino, has that influence. Um, and apparently, um, Mandy McKay, the the Saxon oboe player, is classically trained. Okay. So yeah, you know, he wasn't in t- that little bit of dissonance was completely intentional. Um, and I think. I set this up because I feel like these guys were an influence on the last two bands we reviewed, Free Spot and LCD yes. Sound System. Yeah. And I think in the sense that they were a big influence on New Wave and Sophistapop in general, and Free Spot definitely pulls from that. Um, I think yeah. LCD Sound System does to an extent, too. Um, definitely. Sort of, um, it, let's see. So here's some of the other bands I heard. Uh, in this uh i hear Susie and the banshees definitely Uh like cities and dust um and and franz ferdinand too right um i'm surprised you haven't mentioned one person as being an influence on roxy who they've admitted to um well there's i've got a much longer list of people (laughs) he's been influenced by obviously and of course the first is bowie yeah okay that's what i was waiting for (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> They've admitted to the Bowie influence. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Like the the next song, they they really steal a lot. <laughs> Onto that song, track two, end of the line. Um, this is basically a country song. Kind of, yeah. Um, it's it's very cabaret. It's probably my yeah. pick for it. It is my pick for weakest <laughs> on the album, actually, because it is just kind of like a leftover Beatles song yeah. that they just. They took this Bowie medley yeah. from, or melody from, I'm thinking Diamond Dogs? It, it was a Bowie album before this, obviously. Right, right. Because Bowie did not take from them. No, I checked on that, actually. They admit to being influenced by Bowie, not the other way around. Um, yeah. <laughs> although, I mean, Eno went on to work with Bowie and completely changed his sound, so. Of course. Yeah. Um, but I do like the slow harmonic and piano intro. That was a nice change. Um, nice harmonies. Um, I love the solo. It's the violin solo that's kind of double tracked. It's got this nice crystal guitar sound. Um, I love the vocal and piano parts leading into verse three. Kind of reminds me of superheroes. Just kind of an ah thing. Um, leading into verse three, there's that instrumental break in super. This superheroes from Rocky Horror. Oh, okay. That that instrumental section in superheroes reminds it. It reminds me of that a lot, and I love superheroes. Um. The bass part, the outro is great. Um, surprise, like I said, surprise John Gustafson isn't better known. Um, but yeah, it's not one of the better songs in the album. It's just kind of there. On to track three, Sentimental Fool. I like that they move into each other. Yeah, they fade into each other nicely. It's got this nice, soft, creepy beginning with this brilliant fuzz guitar. And the bass groove when it comes in is great, but it's it doesn't really even establish that groove until a minute and a half into the song. I was kind of hoping for an instrumental here, honestly. Uh-huh. With that, when I heard that guitar, I was kind of like, I could, I could go for this for like six minutes. It's it's really <laughs> proggy. Um, the drums come in at two twenty, the vocal comes in at two twenty eight, and it's only like a six minute song. 
Yeah. So my uh, my third influence on them, because I'd say the Beatles, of course, would be mm-hmm. second. Yeah. But the third, and this one, of course, is very reminiscent of, would be Pink Floyd. Yeah, yeah. I can hear a lot of Floyd in this one. Um, I mean, the, even like the sound effect intro to the album is, you know, very dark side of the mood, you know, getting yeah. into the car to drive right. off, you know, kind of thing. Um, love Harry's falsetto. Um, the chorus has a real strong Bowie feel. Um, and I, I love that it's just this long instrumental opening, a verse, an extended chorus, an extended instrumental break, and then a bridge i'll call it a bridge because it's just this another another section of the song that just goes to a cold sudden stop right the build in this is just so fucking cool i i mean it this is one of those albums where i'm like this one this one's probably gonna be my favorite and then it kind of like moved along no no Uh this one (laughs) (laughs) they kind of they threw in they went to like the pop song to begin with and yes. I love Love is a Drug. I listen to it all the time. But then they kind of went to the kind of meh, slower song. And then they got serious. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. On to track four, Whirlwind. This is my pick for favorite. Nice, heavy opening. It's just this classic glam rock track. You know, heavy glam yeah. rock. Love the warble in Fairy's voice. The this first... is very much a Tull song, I think. I mean, this yeah, is I can just hear some rock. Tull. And, you know, with with that lilt of, you know. <laughs> but it's kind of glam tall because it's definitely got a glam feel to it. Yeah. Um, it's also the first proper guitar solo, which isn't bad. Just kind of a little meandering. Um, How far was tall really away from from glam, though, honestly? I mean, they had their folk influences and stuff. Mm-hmm, but and classical. I mean, and, and classical. But they, you know, they, yeah. there was definitely... They leaned it could, into they glam. They could easily yeah. have gone into glam. Yeah, yeah, they kind of leaned a little bit. You're right. Um, but I love how this, it, it kind of stretches out into this kind of mid-tempo piano glam thing. And then they go back to this nice heavy opening, ends with some nice, nice, noisy guitar. It's just a simple rock song, but I, I, I love yeah. it. Yeah, it is a good straight up rock song. Yeah, I like it a lot too. Uh, on to track five, She Sells. This is like prog year ELO. Right. I mean, at first I was kind of like, ah, good. Uh, yeah. This is this is kind of more with the beginning of this is what I, more of what I was expecting mm-hmm. when I come, came into this cuz I, I mean, I've listened to some Roxy albums. I don't think I've heard this one before though. Uh-huh. Um and it's kind of like, oh, okay, they're just doing like a poppy disco, you know, thing. It's, it's what I was expecting. And then like 30 seconds in, these <laughs> violins kick in. Yeah. And then some weird background vocals on them too. So I'm like, oh, oh, there's something going on yeah, here. Yeah. Great off kilter groove. Love the atonal sax solo. McKay was amazing. The things he he would add to to a rock band with <laughs> a, a sax and an oboe are brilliant. Also, love the way the the kind the clavinet and the guitar compete with you know the sax solo. And the clavinet reminded me a lot of Trampled Underfoot by Zeppelin, which came out the same year. Um, I put Zeppelin on my list, too, of influences mm -hmm. here at work, obviously. You say Zeppelin and the Beatles. They influenced literally everyone that came after them. True. True. (laughs) You wouldn't expect Zeppelin and Roxy music, though, just like you wouldn't expect Tull and Roxy music. Um, but, uh, but they're, they're there if you really listen yeah. closely enough. There's this great sudden timing change in the second half. Very unpredictable. That was it. I loved that. That was like, oh, <laughs> that's really awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I the... could sit through that that disco thing at the beginning to, yeah. to, to do this. And the harmony. And it's off and... a lyrical pun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it was my third listen where I finally got the lyrical pun of she sells speed. And then it like slows down. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh. Oh, well played, sir. Fairy's <laughs> lyrics are very interesting. <laughs> yeah. I don't have any quotes less... offhand, but, you know, it, it is interesting what he does with, with birds. And harmonically, it gets really interesting toward the end. Very complicated. Yes. Love, that love last, that. like, minute or so is just this real Beatles trippy, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> strawberry field kind yeah. of thing. After you had just started with, like, disco, but <laughs> now you're, like, into this... And it's not just disco; it's ELO. Yes, that's it's, very true. It's, and it's imagine kind of every ELO song you've ever heard. That's most of 
she sells. And then it gets really interesting about halfway through. I mean, I think it is just like a drug, you know, mm-hmm. you're high, you're, you're bouncing around, and then yeah. everything's getting, you know, sad <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. drawn out. On to track six, Could It Happen to Me? I want to reference yes so badly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I love how the guitar and sax harmonize in the intro. And it's just this nice, soft, off-kilter piano ballad. This is the one that reminds me of Ian Anderson. It's, I I was thinking Chicago, actually. Yeah. You know, with like, mm-hmm. it, it's very, like, the early is, like, very, the early part of the song is, like, very yeah. early to mid-60s kind of pop where they're just kind of, you know, mm-hmm. going into it. But then there's this really interesting kind of jagged sax and guitar part <laughs> after the verse. That's just kind of your first hint of like, yeah, we were starting with this fairly cliche thing that we're going to get interesting. <laughs> right. I think it's around 90 seconds mm-hmm. into it, which I mean, it's only three and a half minute yeah. song. You suddenly get this blaring fuzzy guitar. That's just love the tone on that solo. Um, nice short solo too. Um, kind of off balance. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's I, like you move through the entire 60s yeah, in yeah. about two minutes time, actually, because then I that's the late 60s. Can't get my head around the timing in this one. It just shifts so much. <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. And the, the sax are probably an oboe part, and the last verse is really interesting. Um, I, I have to admit, I can't really tell the difference between the two. Um, on to track seven, burning both ends. Both ends burning, sorry. Um, this is the other Duran Duran song. Yeah, this is my pick for favorite. It's just Interesting. way ahead of its time. It, I mean, it's practically girls on film. Yeah, yeah. five years before girls on film. Because I hear that a lot of girls on film sound. in the first one, but yeah, similar. That but, keyboard yeah. sound in this is mm. like, I mean, flock of seagulls yeah, just yeah. said, "Oh yeah, we'll use that." <laughs> this great jarring synth in the opening. <laughs> um. I mean, it's like. It's like Prague with like Stevie Wonder kind of funk, mm-hmm. not not Parliament funk, but Stevie Wonder funk, which is a little, you know, lighter. Yeah, yeah it's a great 70s groove, but 70s in a good way. Um, yeah. And the keyboard parts panned on hard on each side, very 80s, very ahead of their time. Yes. Nice conga part. Way ahead. I will say it's my weakest only because it gets very monotonous. It just I, hangs yeah, in one groove. Well, yeah, that that's I think that's the point though. <laughs> yeah, and then I had to pick a weakest. <laughs> On to track eight, Nightingale. Acoustic guitar at the beginning, which is a nice change of pace. Yeah. Um first time in the album. Um it plays nicely off of this heavily delayed electric. Um love how big the drums sound when they finally come in. Nice groove. The bass is nicely ahead of the beat, kinda of leading the song. Um <clears throat> I like that it's softened back uh, into the beginning after the verse, because the verse gets a little intense, um, yeah. and there's this nice soft instrumental break. It's just a nice ballad that gets you know a little loud here, great dynamics. I um, love the sound of the, I'm going to say, oboe solo, and <laughs> that has this kind of sinister harmony behind it. It gets dark during the solo. And that's what they do beautifully in this, and that's... That's kind of why I like my Roxy music when mm-hmm. he's dark, not to, yeah, not the stuff that later. Um... <laughs> I, I will say, uh, Ferry's voice get does get a little buried toward the end, or toward the bend in the mix though, toward the end. Um, Ferry's voice, I, I think we should talk about that too. It is, it's very strange. It's like mm-hmm. he has invented some sort of accent of his own, yeah, yeah. while singing. You know, well, he was kind of always playing a character. Yeah. This kind of foppish, you know, Euro trash guy. <laughs> you know, he was always kind of in character, dressed the part too. That was the other yeah. way. They invented Sophistapop. If you've seen the pictures of them, you know, look at Spandau Ballet, look at Ferry with Roxy music. <laughs> oh, you know? yeah, totally. They were Spandau Ballet, Ballet a decade before Spandau Ballet. Um, but, you know, Ferry's voice is interesting because he's a chameleon. Yeah. He can handle anything but kind of put his own stamp on it my sometimes first... i really like it mm-hmm. and sometimes it kind of rubs me the wrong way uh-huh. <laughs> that's always a good sign <laughs> um but my first exposure to him was his solo stuff in the early 80s yeah same which here. was super pop oh god yeah 
So when yeah, I it's funny how people bust Phil Collins balls, <laughs> you like give him a pass. And it's like really, <laughs> well, because the band didn't change. Hmm. You know. Oh wait a minute! No, no, no! Wait a minute! Well, they did like Avalon and stuff. Oh, did they? Okay, I need to check out. Oh my god! Stuff. They did. Okay. No, you don't. You don't need to check it out. <laughs> okay, I'll take that statement I, back then because I, I, I mean, I'm familiar there's with some people that are like you know swear by that and and think that's a brilliant album and all that, but uh, I like, uh, I just hear that single Avalon from it, and I'm like, I don't want to hear any more of that. Is that the one with more than this? <laughs> I think so. Okay. I think so. It is. Uh, it, it is. It just all sounds like that anyway, mm-hmm. even if it is. Right. Honestly, so that's why okay. I kind of. I had so, a lot of trepidation coming into this. I mean, I've heard earlier Roxy albums, uh-huh. and uh, it's I know. Kind of like oh, all right. I listened to this one. I skimmed the first two albums f- to check out the Eno stuff. It sounds pretty much the same as this. Um, so I just kind of figured they were consistent like that, but apparently he did pull a Collins. And a Nick, I won't say a Nick Virgilio because Nick didn't ruin the band when he took over. Um, <laughs> they did change quite a bit, but he didn't ruin Spock's. Um, but he pulled the Collins. Um, and yeah, maybe he does, you know, and there wasn't even a lineup change when he did it. <laughs> no, no, he just decided, I'm going to sell a shit ton of records yeah. and do soft rock. <laughs> and not just in his solo career, because I wasn't going to blame him for that, because, you know, your solo career right. is your solo career. Same with Collins. Um, Anyway, on to the last track. Track nine, just another high. Nice, either clavinet or electric piano in the opening. Mixes well with the guitar sound. Um, mm. in- interesting that they bring the they kind of build the sound. They bring bring the drums in without the bass, um, but when the bass comes in, really fills it out. Nice sitar impersonation on the solo, because <laughs> I checked the credits. It's not they don't say anything about a sitar, so it's 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 a guitar, but it sounds like. Um, I get a star. Just a nice kind of mid-tempo closer for the album. Yeah, it's weird because there isn't like an al- a, a structure to the album where they have a climax or anything. It mm. just kind of does what it does yeah. and then goes. <laughs> I kind of get that impression about the band. They just kind of do what they do. There's not a lot of planning involved. <laughs> They're just kind of all on a whim. All right, so other influences I did not mention out of the list. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got Velvet Underground, mm-hmm. like which I think that's kind of akin to to them, where it's just it's out there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we putting it all up. Uh, Crimson, of course. Yeah, the uh, sax. Yeah, the sax, the jazzy mm-hmm. guitars, and yeah. uh, of course, there's James Brown with the mm-hmm. grooves. Well, and, and Brown then, is another one that influenced everybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then of course Santana. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know Santana influenced every guitar player. That's true. And also, Perry mentioned that that Latin music was a big influence on Manzera because he's Latino. So, it, I think maybe so it wasn't just a group of white guys playing funk. <laughs> um, so it, it, I think he and and Carlos were just pulling from the same sources because Santana was a Latino Latin was a Latin music. Just yeah. with heavy guitar. Um, anyway, do you recommend it? I definitely do. I was not... I went into this thinking I was not going to like it all that much, or at least be meh, and uh, wound up really enjoying this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely recommend it. And I need to listen to more of their stuff, although apparently I'll stop before Avalon. <laughs> yes. Is that their last album? Or... I don't know. Okay, it, it's kind of like... I think I think it's like early '90s where music went to die. '90s, because this was they lasted through the '80s. I th- yeah, I think he came back. And, oh, okay, uh, it's a reunion album. I would have skipped that anyway. I would have stuck with I their '70s so. stuff. Like, I, uh, I wouldn't trust anything after like Ferry's early solo stuff in the '80s. Uh, and even that stuff doesn't really hold up very well, you know. Oh, no, like no. The, the, even the one he did with like David Gilmore for the movie uh, mm-hmm. Legend. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, like it sounds a lot better on paper, but then you're kind of like, e. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, Avalon's eighty-two. Okay, so it was the so, tail end, right of the crossover when he went solo. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would probably have stopped there. Um, because I wouldn't have trusted that. Because Ferry wrote most of the stuff anyway. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Brian yeah. Perry's the primary songwriter. So if he's doing crap in his, so- his solo career, the band's probably going to suck too. <laughs> and that was that was the thing between him and Eno. I think they were both they both wanted input, mm-hmm. and uh, rather than driving each other crazy or you know to hatred, you know, they just and did away. more interesting things. Oh, and of course, I should mention a, a big influence on Lady Tron, who took their oh, name yeah. from one of their early singles. Oh, yeah, yeah, I noticed that it was on one of the two <laughs> Eno albums. Yeah. And Lady Tron was an influence on Freeze Pop, definitely, because um, I remember I saw an interview with Sean recently saying that, you know, they would tour places in the early days and, you know, try to get desperately get people to come to their shows and end up playing, like, across the street from Lady Tron. <laughs> Like I, I was gonna say, I thought they actually were like contemporaries. They were pretty much well. No, he was saying like when time. when they were getting started, Lady Tron would end. Up, they'd end up like playing across the street from Lady Tron, who were like already established and much much bigger. Yeah. Um. Anyway, that's it for Siren. Until next time, we'll be reviewing Fifty One Fifty by Van Halen. This is already Van Halen tribute. Yeah, we're gonna I know be what those you're guys. Thinking, guys. <laughs> but I've heard I. I literally saw an interview on CBS Sunday Morning mm-hmm. where they shoehorned an Eddie Van Halen tribute into it, but it was really just a David Lee Roth interview. Right. A lot of these tributes I'm hearing are really stuff that that's more about David Lee right, Roth. Right. With, I mean, has its place mm-hmm. when he dies. <laughs> I was but... looking at the track listing on the first album. It's a brilliant album. It is. But it everybody's is talking album. about the first album. Ex- yeah, that's the other thing. Everyone is talking about the first album. So, yes, we are going to do some fucking Van Hagar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we're focusing on Eddie Van Halen because, right. I mean, you're not gonna, we're not going to really focus much on Hagar. Well, Hagar's a great singer. I, I you know, I, I'm not going to shout, you're going to slag Hagar. He's a great singer. <laughs> but he's great at what he does, as is Roth. They do very <laughs> different things. Right. He's a better, you know, this was the, this has always been the debate. Roth is the better performer or was when he, you know, yeah. before, when he was in his prime, Hagar is okay. the better singer. Um, anyway, that's next week. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget wherever you go in life. There you are. There you are. There you are.